Hey, it's Sylvan, and this is the Handpan Podcast. Joining me in this episode is my good friend and longtime Hong and Handpan player, Josh Rivera. Josh is from North Dakota, and he and his wife moved to North Carolina a few years ago to join the Siraz Handpans team, founded by Mark Garner in Asheville. There is so much to Josh's passion for music that we will have to cover some of these other areas in future episodes, like how Josh's live performances on the handpan are actually always real, authentic, and refreshing improvisations, or the story of how Josh learned to tune handpans and joined Mark on the Suraz team. But in this episode, we tap into Josh's wealth of knowledge around the tuning of our instruments. So lean in because there's going to be a lot of insights into the physics of sound and music theory, and I think it'll give us a greater appreciation of our instrument, how unique and special and artful it is. So let's jump right in to a conversation with Josh Rivera. Hey Josh, thanks for joining me for this episode. Hey, Sylvan, thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. So we actually uh, got to hang out at a handpan gathering in Colorado about a month ago. And during that time, you actually retuned one of my handpans. And uh, it sounds so great. I mean, there's nothing like the joy of playing a handpan that's back in tune. And it's also a really good reminder of what goes into the making and the tuning of these instruments. And one of the things that you mentioned when retuning my handpan was this concept of blending. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, blending. Um, blending, as I've mentioned a couple times, has been a topic that's come up quite a bit in life lately as far as tuning goes. Um, when we sat together, uh, we tuned your instrument, which was a beautiful instrument. And um, while we were tuning it, it was kind of fun to listen to the difference of what, you know, if we were, I think we were tuning that center note when uh, when we both kind of had that little like uh, aha moment of stepping back. We are like, man, it's crazy how different, um, you know, three to four cents can make in the tuning stage and what it can do to the sound. Mm -hmm. And we had tuned the center note, I think it was maybe two cents sharp on the fundamental and just dropping it to minus three cents uh, flat completely opened up this whole bloom and um this you know this really nice characteristic that it had and you know a really soft tone um and you know in a in a tuning standard zero sense is you know i guess that's about what you consider about perfect uh in the in the digital realm or the you know and how um how the the standard works is basically zero sense is about a perfect note if you would and um but then from there, you can start kind of tweaking uh, tweaking the sound a bit. Uh, I used to do actually a lot of, uh, I went to school for audio engineering and recorded bands and do a lot of mixing and mastering and stuff. So um, subtleties, uh, subtleties in sound and active listening have been quite um, quite a big part of my life in the last uh, 15 years. And um, I'm starting to find that with, you know, in the tuning realm, I, you know, it's a lot of us tuners are, you know, we we go from learning how to just, you know, we're just trying to get those lines green on the tuner, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you just want to see those three lines light up green, and then you've got your note at least sounding like a note. And then, um, and then as we get deeper into it, we start trying to get really, really tight. Uh, at least I did. You know, my experience was I, I wanted all zeros. And so, you know, most, uh, for people that don't know, uh, a lot of handpan notes in general, the standard is to have a fundamental, an octave, and a fifth. And um, they all tune, um, you know, the, uh, as you're tuning the note, they all move around. And so the big game of trying to tune is getting all these frequencies just to kind of fall into place together because you can't tune one and not the other. They all tune at the same time. Yeah. So, so you know, the the next goal is to try to get everything at zero. You know, when I was learning to tune, I was like, man, I want to get them all perfect. I want them all zeros completely. And uh, I think it's a, an important skill to have to be able to to tune tightly because then you can start manipulating the frequencies a little bit later on. But um, I started finding I don't really like a completely zeroed out instrument. If every single note on that instrument is at zero cents, it actually 
it actually kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Why is that? It, you know, I think it's um, it's almost like this too pristine. It, I always, you know, I always kind of dumb it down to um, like the difference between, say, uh, an old analog record that was mixed and mastered really well versus um, a perfectly digitalized CD that's like too perfect. You know what I mean? Mm. There's this love that we our ears have for subtleties and difference and change, and it's really ears or it's really easy for our ears to fatigue. Um, uh, fatiguing ears is a, is a big thing in audio mastering and engineering where a lot of times, I mean, if things are too perfect, your, your ears actually kind of react funny and it's hard to listen to a CD that's a hundred percent digital perfect levels for too long. There's a, uh, so a lot of times in digital music, they'll add, you know, sometimes they'll even just add room noise, just something that's, uh, an actual air element, uh, to the sound and the frequencies to kind of break everything up from this perfect zeros and ones sort of thing and so um yeah so so i kind of you know from my personal taste and you know in my tuning experience with uh working with people um i've gotten a lot of good feedback with uh getting to that point where once once you have the skill i think it's very important to have a skill as a tuner to be able to tune all zeros and and be able to uh you know move frequencies around to that fine level but after a while i think it's really nice um to use that skill in a more creative way because Eventually, in if you tune enough, you you start getting to the point where you start feeling kind of like a robot in a way. But it's just like all your your one goal is just to make everything zero, and mm. that doesn't feel very creative. And uh, and honestly, my ears just personally don't like it. And um, so I've gotten to this point now where I'm starting to get the notes into a place that is in tune, but then allow myself the freedom to where if I really like the timbre of the sound, I'm not gonna ignore that and then try to make a perfect zero or you know a perfect line on the tuner it's um it's it is something i think that you know felix did get into at some point when he when he started doing free free tuning and mm-hmm. you know i could understand that was a very um there was a very deep level he went with that and i didn't understand it and to a point i can kind of see where he was going when it when it, with that because if you do lock yourselves into too much of this perfection stage in the tuning realm i do think there's some uh, there's some art and there's some creativity lost and how far you want to go with that is obviously a personal choice um yeah. I, I I tend to I tend to have a realm I stay within, you know, um, and then let the freedom kind of take over. Um, but I also try not to let that lock me in too much either. So like like with your note when we were tuning it, you know, I mean I I personally tend to really enjoy having the, like a low note. It's kind of like a piano tuning mm-hmm. um, is the way I like to, it was actually what kind of got me started on blending a little bit more was when you look at piano tuning, you know, a lot of times it's what the fourth, the fourth register roughly on a piano is tuned almost perfectly with a, with a strobe tuner. Mm-hmm. And then everything below it and above it is somewhat free tuned by ear. Um, because if you perfectly match that, they just, they kind of clash with each other. And so you want, you might want to go flatter as you, go lower and a little sharper as you go higher or you just want to deviate the frequencies so that way everything kind of sits in its own place and um that's kind of what i did with your instrument when we tuned it um that the center note you know it's usually it's a third octave and Mm -hmm. i tend to really enjoy having those third third octaves about three to five cents flat and we really kind of got to see what that does with your note when we had it about two cents sharp you know which is you know perfectly fine in tuning Uh, if anything two you know within two cents to me is that's pretty well tuned but it sounded so much better at minus three than it did at plus two. Like to me, it was a, a world of a difference. Yeah. And um, so those little subtleties are where I think it's really important for you know someone that's tuning uh, when they're when they're thinking about blending to kind of allow their ears to say like, do I like this even though the strobe tuners tell me it's perfectly tuned? That's really fascinating because. I think, as you mentioned, um, with the example of the piano tuning, and even with digital music, mm-hmm. that's that's a conflict that happens in a lot of different ways. This opposition between perfection on, on one end, and on the other end, maybe a desirable sound quality of coming alive, whether it's these old analog recordings from the 1950s before auto-tune, or even like that piano example, I've always heard that a keyboard, a digital keyboard, um, lacks that quote-unquote coming alive um, feel because it is perfectly tuned 
arbitrarily, if I understand based on the the science and, and the physics of sound, that we're just mm -hmm. kind of like normalizing, it's not an equal uh, division of, of these frequencies, we're normalizing it and arbitrarily. Correct, correct. Um, and it's amazing to me that a handband that is perfectly in tune may still lack that desirable sound quality. And then how fun it is that you have a certain level of creative freedom, as you said, you don't want to go too too much out of the tuning. So I wonder, like, is it satisfying to, to retune some of these instruments? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I I find it incredibly satisfying and um you know it, it became it actually became more satisfying when I started allowing myself some creative freedom in the tuning uh, as far as blending goes mm -hmm. um because you know once uh, once I read and once you realize that you know I mean to tune to 440 we're we're still when it comes to the way the frequencies uh, are mathematically um, constructed, we're actually rounding off numbers to, to make 440 um, a tuning spectrum. You know, that's why you hear about uh, Pythagorean theory, about how to tune that way. There's all these different ways to tune because the frequencies, you know, don't don't perfectly double each other. And so we're, you know, mm. when you're tuning to 440, you're already technically tuning to a rounded off number um it can get really deep from there but once i realized that even tuning a 440 and having it perfect it's still technically not perfect um in the in the actual mathematical scheme of a waveform so this this you know this knowledge kind of allowed me to trust my ears a little bit more and granted i've had lots of ear training through um audio work that i've done in the past and i just never really I, I never really thought it'd be able to transfer over to tuning. And once I kind of started diving into that realm and trusting my ears and allowing myself that freedom, it, it was incredibly, now it's incredibly satisfying to tune. For a while, it kind of drove me crazy because you're just trying to get these zeros and ones and whether you like it or not, that's what you go for. And I think that's a hard thing too when you're retuning someone's instrument and say the customer is watching you. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's really, you almost kind of want them to see all these perfectly green lines because, you know, in their eyes, they, you know, if they see some deviations, it might, they might think like maybe you're being a lazy tuner or maybe if another tuner sees that i left some frequencies at like five cents flat it might look like i was being lazy um when in fact um it's not that i could get it to zero it's just that once it fell into this place i really enjoyed that timbre and i just kind of decided you know that timbre sounds great i just want to leave it right there and it, and if i play the whole instrument and it still works i'm gonna leave it there if it doesn't work if it sounds out i might go back and readjust it I, I like that you mentioned that throughout the, the tuning process. And I really wanted to be a part of it when you retuned my instrument because it's so uh, fascinating. Now, sure. <laughs> you know, quick word of caution for people who may not have been there when their handpan was made or retuned. It's intense. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're hammering um, the crap out of that, that handpan, but that's what <laughs> it takes. And um, yeah. Yeah, we're doing all the things you're not supposed to do to the instrument. We're, we do all those to make them in tune. And then and then no one's allowed to do that again until it gets tuned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. A thought that like an image that comes to mind is watching your handpan get retuned. It's kind of like when you're donating blood and you look at the needle entering your vein and you, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 painful. It's it's uncomfortable to watch. Um, uh -huh. But obviously, you know what you're doing. And um and then having these explanations around, I'm not being lazy, it just, it could sound better if it was just a little bit off and to actually hear that because you're right, like we could hear the bloom of the ding mm -hmm. um, and it really made a difference and um, uh, yeah, it's really fascinating. So you have must have, over the years, retuned some handpans that were in really, really bad shape. Do you have any stories about that? Oh, man. Um, I, I've had some humbling experiences in tuning, and I've had some... I, I've had lots of experiences in tuning, but um, as far as... Uh, 
as far as doing really bad stuff, I have, yeah, I have tunes. In ways, I, I will say this, in ways, it's almost easier to tune a really poor, poorly built instrument just because I have a little less attachment to the overall sound, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? If it was already kind of slapped together, it's, you know, no matter what I do in the tuning stage, I mean, tuning... Tuning is a fine art in itself, but so is so is building and constructing the instrument, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. So if if there wasn't if there wasn't a fine level of detail that goes into the shaping and building of the instrument, it's really hard to really put that level into the tuning as well, because you're already being handed something that you can't really do a whole lot with. Yeah. And so in ways, it's actually a lot less stressful for me to tune something that's uh, pretty pretty poorly built and way out of shape because. Um, you know, you basically that's that's the time I just make the lines green and everybody walks away happy. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's like well, this thing is just in tune. Yay, we can go play again. Um, it gets uh, it gets much scarier uh, as you start working on things like first gen Hong. Because first gen Hong, you have to. Um, you have to make a lot of a lot of skill decisions on whether you want to. They leave a lot of frequencies in some places that we're not used to in today's standard tuning. Mm-hmm. So you know there might be seconds or thirds or fourths or sixths or you know there might be some really oddball frequencies. And it used to be very very tempting to change those and dial them into like a fifth or something like that. Yeah. And when it comes to the first gen Hong, you've once you've done that, you I you know I used to. Um, I used to, you know, get in little, not really spats, but little, you know, like conversations online about what should be done about this sort of thing. And some people are very passionate about, you know, you're being lazy if you don't dial it in. And some people are like really passionate about you don't touch it. It's a hong. And I'm, I've one that in my personal experiences kind of fall into this place where I like to leave a lot of those imperfections in a hong that we consider imperfections because, like, you know that iconic first-gen sound comes mm-hmm. from a lot of oddball frequencies. And so when it comes to experiences, you know, I've, I've tuned in, my, in the past, I've tuned both ways, and I've had people get mad at me for both ways. <laughs> uh, you know, like, one person was like, upset that I didn't put fifths on and just left them, and they're like, well, what I pay you to tune for? And I was like, well... This is kind of where I'm at. And I've had other people, you know, before that, I had tuned something to a fifth and people got really upset. They're like, well, now it doesn't sound like my hong. And so these experiences, uh, you know, they're very, very necessary to go through as we develop what should be done. You know, at, at times I was really devastated about that sort of thing happening. You never obviously want to walk away with someone being unhappy about your tuning work because yeah. it's a very, very personal and emotional thing for both the person that owns the instrument and for my work. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, as, as we go through these things, and have these experiences it's really kind of fascinating to kind of see which side of the fence people are falling into and the only way to do that and to push forward is by you know kind of throwing yourself in the deep end and just experiencing these things and it's um you know it's really terrifying i i can't i can say that you know as an experience is um i've had some terrifying moments when i first started learning (laughs) because There's not a lot of ways to practice tuning a first gen hong, and yeah. you know, there's it's not like you get to just have one every single day and you know practice and play around with it. You can't hit these things any more than necessary because it's metal, you know. And eventually, every hammer strike is going to affect the sound, and so you kind of just have to sometimes, you know, just just pray that you've you're doing this with for the right reason and you're going into it with no ego and you're just truly trying to learn and when they if things go if people are upset if you know if you walk away in these different situations it's kind of like it's all part of the learning process and yeah and i can totally attest to uh how thorough and uh, just how respectful towards you know, my instrument you were, and I appreciate that. And uh, I recommend that everyone would go uh, check out your work uh, if they need a retune. And actually, where can people find more information about your retuning services, Josh? Yeah, well, hey, thank you for that. I really, uh, you know, again, I always appreciate the trust, especially. I mean, you're, you're, you're one of the, you're one of the old school players of this and ambassadors of this instrument. So mm-hmm. I, the trust you had to uh, let me tune your instrument, I can't thank you enough. Um, but uh, as far as finding out, um, I do have a website, and uh, it's RiveraSteelTuning.com. 
And on there, I have kind of, you know, your, your some basic information. Um, I would like to expand the website more as I get going. Um, but right now, it's um, kind of has the instructions on, you know, what I look for uh, as far as, you know, like if you want me to tune it, I would love to have a video so I can give you a good, accurate idea of what kind of work's going to go into it. Um, stuff like that. I also, I post on Instagram, you know, randomly I'll put up some before and after videos. Um, I used to be obsessed with those kind of videos before, actually when I first started tuning, before I started tuning, those were always my favorite. I loved hearing transformations. Um, so on Instagram and YouTube, I have a YouTube channel and they're all also, uh, Rivera still tuning. And so, um, the, the standard mediums, you can find me on there. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Josh, thanks so much for taking the time. And uh, I have no doubt that this will be helpful to someone out there who um, has maybe an instrument that's slightly out of tune and uh, who's not getting as much joy with it. Um, so folks listening, uh, if you need uh, retuning services, uh, contact Josh at Rivera Steel Tuning, and he will help you out. But thanks again, Josh. Um, what are you off to today? Um, I actually have two first gen Hong sitting downstairs for me to finish fine tuning. So that oh will my. be my day. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So I'm uh, very fortunate to be able to, you know, that's one of the benefits of the job. I get to play a lot of these beautiful instruments. Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> well, yeah. good luck with those. I'm sure they will turn out great. And I'll keep an eye out for these before and after videos uh, on your website and channels. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sylvan. There is so much to unpack from this conversation with Josh. First, folks, the handpan is not a mass-produced commodity. And on the podcast, you'll hear me refer to this instrument and its community of players and makers as the handpan art form. Sure, it's a market, and it might even be called an industry at some point. But Josh's insights remind us that there is creativity in art involved in the very making of these instruments. All right, one more thing. Remember when Josh mentions that an instrument that's perfectly in tune drives him crazy because it lacks character and originality? Well, what if we applied this to how we write music, play gigs, build instruments, put together events, and all other kinds of projects? What if we gave ourselves creative freedom, like Josh does when tuning handpans? to actually create something original and meaningful. That's it for this episode of the Handpan Podcast. If you want to experience the simple joy of creating, join our community on the Handpan Podcast Facebook group. It's a safe place to share your video and audio recordings, your thoughts and photos about your own creative journey. There's no competition or ego trip, and it doesn't need to be perfect. Remember, perfect is kind of overrated. It's just a safe place for us to connect in a meaningful way. So if that resonates with you, hope to see you soon on the Handpan Podcast Facebook group. Thanks for listening to the Handpan Podcast, and see you in the next episode.